right, I would say let's get started with this talk. So hello and welcome uh, from Stockholm here. It's amazing that you've all found your way into this talk and it's my pleasure to spend the next 20 minutes with you all talking about a topic that I'm personally very passionate about, data portraits. My name is Mark Beamer. I'm a digital product designer at Futurist here in Stockholm, where we create digital products and services. My background is in cognitive systems and interactive media, and that's probably one of the reasons uh, that fueled my passion for creative coding. So you could say I'm sort of like lost in between the three, three competencies of design, technology, and data. And luckily, Futurist, the company that I'm working at, is that too. So it's pretty easy to find people to form a team um, and be enthusiastic about fun projects around creative coding. And as you can guess, data portraits is one of these things that finds itself within that triangle of competence. But before we jump into the details of how data portrait works and how it combines these three, I want to take a step back, take a step back and talk a bit about portraiture in general. And actually, we're going to take quite some step backs because we're going to jump into the year 1503. Because this is the year when Leonardo da Vinci started painting probably the most famous portrait of all time, the Mona Lisa. And as you can see, a portrait is simply some sort of representation, simply said, a representation of a person. So you could be capturing another person like Leonardo da Vinci did in this one. And usually it contains significant qualities or features of that person, like the face or some body parts, like in this case, the shoulders and the arms that we can see. But it does not always need to be a painting of someone else. Portraits could also be paintings of oneself, like this famous one, self-portrait with straw hat from Vincent van Gogh. Or sometimes portraits are not even paintings at all. If we travel even further back in time, we find portraits and forms of sculptures, like this Egyptian bust um, that, that you can see here. But portraits have always been a bit more than only just a record of someone. They've been used to show power, importance, virtue, beauty, or other qualities. So in a sense, a portrait stands in for a person and it shapes the way that we, the ones that look at the portrait, or thinking about that person that we're seeing there, how we would act or how we would imagine our future with these persons to be. Or like Pope Leon X that you can see here on the right, they might end up turning into a meme. And if we look closer at portraits, the true magic of it lies in this relation between the subject, the artist and the audience. As the artist usually has a certain relationship to that subject that he or she is portraying. And this, this relationship is something that the artist wants to take into the, the art piece and send that message over to the audience who's looking at, at this certain art piece. And then the audience is on the other hand side interpreting that picture that they're seeing or that, that portray that they're seeing in a sense through the eyes of that artist. And that's often what we call uh, resemblance. So resemblance is, you could say it is the artist's aim to resemble certain characteristics um, or qualities of a person in their portraits. That sounds pretty abstract. So let's let's take a look at a concrete example to make clear of what I'm talking about here. If we look at this portrait from the 1600 of Elizabeth I, the artist represents Elizabeth as kind of like a, a glorified person. Like it's a very prestigious painting. You can see a lot of glorification, serenity in that, in that image. Versus if we look at that painting from the early 2000s of uh, Queen Elizabeth II, you might get the feeling that the artist had a more honest or deeper reflection of the character that he or she wanted to portray in that, in that one. And Pablo Picasso really hit the nail with one of his famous sayings um, about this, this quality. Our, um, Pablo Picasso said, are we to paint what's on the face, what's inside the face, or at what's behind it? And I think this is a perfect quote to really show this, this case of that it can be so different of what you're trying to portray in, in your portrait. And we can see how this, this question is answered in different ways over time. 
so if we look at medieval times, a portrait was not always about the person, like the physical appearance of that person. It was more about the Greek or Roman ruler. So it wasn't really this glorification style. Versus in the Renaissance, what you can see here, it was more about deeply reassembling the physical appearance of a person. So getting as close to that physical appearance and that person as a whole as possible. But that changed over time of removing more towards serialism where Pablo Picasso came into the game. That changed. So he was trying to portray different things than just the physical, uh, physical appearance, as you can see in this one. And if we jump even further in the 20th century, we all of a sudden have photography that comes into the game where you can have a portrait created by a, a photo photographer. And here you don't have this resemblance anymore that you can manipulate so much of what you are trying to portray. For sure, you can see like what kind of posture that person should have um, in that picture. So you have a certain degree of freedom there, but it's very different to the paintings that we've seen here before. And a snapshot that you would typically take on a street is most likely not resembling a portrait because it's just a snapshot. You don't put that intention to it of capturing something or somebody in that moment uh, and that essence of that person. And if we jump even further, today we're touching into a new era of portraits, what we call data portraits. So we're collecting so much data about persons out there that actually allow us or enable us to depict different aspects of a person and just their physical appearance that we see. And the foundations of that notion of data ports was laid out by Judith Donath and her team at the Harvard Berkman Center in Cambridge, Massachusetts. So simply stated, data portraits are artworks that depict the data accumulated about a person rather than their face or some sort of physical appearance. All right, representations of accumulated data about a person. So does that mean that this, for example, so the, the visualizations that we see on smartwatches, about our heart rates and other data that's collected about us, is that a data portrait? The short answer would be no. And if we take the longer answer, I will tell you that we would need to differentiate between data visualization on the one hand side and data portraits on the other hand side. Data visualization is per se pretty neutral because you're just turning the data that you have into a different format. So you're not manipulating or changing the data. It's algorithmic, non-semantic. So you're not inducing anything. You're just showing it in a different way. Versus data portraits are more artistic. So you have an artist that is taking that data and turning it into something. So they're inducing semantic meaning into the data that, uh, that they're portraying. And usually that is created through a metaphor. So data portraits can be quite metaphorical versus data visualizations remain rather neutral. All right, with that said, let's actually look at some examples of data portraits. And the first one that I want to start with is this one called People Garden, which is trying to visualize a virtual space where, you can, where people are having discussions online. So it's like an online forum with multiple boards where people engage in discussions. And it's using the metaphor of a flower to represent these different, uh, the different people that are engaged in these discussions. And the more time a person spends on a certain board, the higher the flower grows. So that's sort of the metaphor that the artist decided to use here. And then the blossom of, uh, of the flower that you can see here consists of either this magenta colored people or the blue, uh, blue colored people forming the bloom of that flower. And depending on if it is a reply to messages, it would be blue, or if it's an initiation of a new, new message on that board or a new conversation on that board, it will be magenta. So you can see like who's been quite active contributing to the, to the online space versus who's been just very scared in their, uh, in their replies and answers and initiations. And the way that they're representing it with the flowers is sort of easy to understand, very legible. But it could also be reaching a point where this becomes pretty overwhelming because there are too many flowers growing all of a sudden. And on the other hand side, it could also start being very misleading because you don't have any, any context of what is this conversation about. So in this case, we could actually be looking at an online spa space full of hate speech about someone uh, represented as a beautiful flower garden and you would not know. So 
the question really becomes what level of abstraction is useful without taking it too far. So let's look at another example. This one here is called anthropomorphs and it's the same idea. So we're trying to portray a person based on the interaction that they're having or the, the interaction behavior that they're having in this digital space where they can chat and communicate. And here you get this more clear impression that you're actually looking at people rather than flowers, right? And the facial expression or in the color of the body, they're, for example, defined by the average emotional tone that the person brings into the message um, on average. And what you can see in the bodies, these little boxes, they are the actual messages that they're sending into the group. And if it has a thick border outline, it is an initiation of a conversation, whereas the ones without an outline are replies to, to, uh, to a conversation. So the more you engage with the community, the bigger that person grows, or the, the wider, maybe also taller, but mostly wider the person grows. And it's, it's, as I said, like, it's a good thing because you get this sense of, okay, I'm looking at a person, but despite that we're working on body positivity, there are still places out there where um, being taller than wider is considered to be not very appealing. So be, being a good contributor to that society might turn you into something that in your culture doesn't seem to be desirable. So that's also something that you need to consider when creating these artworks um, and work, work with that as an artist. So we're coming back to this note of resemblance, right? So as an artist, you need to look into both directions. On the one hand side, you need to understand how do I want to portray that person that I'm sure that I that I have that relation to, versus how might the audience that I'm giving this artwork to interpret the design that I'm choosing. So really finding the right metaphor is crucial to the success of your of your data portrait. Here's one more example that I personally really like. It is called the uh, Lexigraphs one, and it's about Twitter profiles. So it's using um, using the words that people are tweeting and putting them into this human shaped silhouette. So again, the art the artist it is inducing this meaning of looking at persons. So if you look at this, you can see a community of people, but they're quite abstract, right? And these this outline in words is derived from the updates that they're sending into the group, and it's actually animated. I can try to show that here, animated in the rhythm that they're sending their postings into the group. They're all identically shaped, so the individual character only comes from the specific words that each individual is using. And despite that the silhouette is purely decorative, it still gives and contributes greatly to the sense of looking at individual people here. All right, you might ask yourself, when do I actually use a data portrait now? These have been quite art see projects that I've been showing. But generally speaking, there are two good use cases for data portraits. One is the avatar, data portrait as an avatar. So it is used to represent a person, like the type of contributor. It stands in for that person. It, it shapes how we think about them, how we act about them, and how we imagine our future with them. Versus it can also be used as a data, data mirror. That would be more of a use case towards yourself. So you wanna use it by yourself, trying to visualize your behaviors and get an understanding of that throughout time. And I brought you two use cases here that are maybe a bit more commercial that we've been working on at Futurist um, where we can look, take a look at how we used data portraits. So this first one here, I'll keep that one rather short. Uh, this one is a portrait that we created uh, for portraying your career. So turning your career into one of these lines that you can see here, it would be an online tool. So you could enter step-by-step step the faces that you had in your career and giving them a label of what was it? Was it kind of a job, education, something like that? And how long did it go? Was it over years, a couple of months? And depending on that, we would recreate your career as one of these drawings. And at the end of the day, sorry, at the end of the, of the, the process, the users could select um, highlights in their journey, which we would then turn into these loops that you can see here. And eventually at the end of this, this whole process, users have the chance to either post that on social media so they can use it as an avatar for them uh, to stand in for them 
or they could send it to one of our recruiters, for example, who then has it pretty easy to understand, okay, what is the experience that this person brings to the table? What are the highlights in their career that the person is proud of and that they want to show off? And it can be used as a conversation starter, for example, for, uh, for recruitment interviews. Let's move on to the, the second case study that I have here, which we can take a bit more of a detailed look into it. And this story started with the book that you can see here. So the company decided they want to launch this book called Growth Reinvented. And they wanted to send it out to clients and leads as you do to um, build a relationship with them. But then they noticed, okay, if you just sent the book, that's kind of weird. You want to have some sort of message of why are we sending this right now? What's the context of this? that they would like to attach to the book. I don't know where you're located, but Sweden, in Sweden, people have this weird habit of that they love to send postcards. So the first idea was, okay, why don't we send a postcard with that book that we could write a personal note onto so that people know what this is about. And uh, that's what we wanted to do. So we were thinking, okay, can we just have a postcard? But our office did not have a postcard. so. We were looking for alternatives or actually looking into like creating our own first postcard, but having just a standard print that says the company name doesn't really seem to be super appealing and it's also not very personal. So I was approached on having an, trying to find an idea on how we could turn this into something more playful and more fun. And I had the idea of turning this postcard into a data portrait of the person who's sending the postcard. So that as a receiver, you could actually learn a bit about the person that sent you this book and the postcard. And to start, to start this off, we started defining what we actually want to portray about the person. And we came up with a list of nine questions that you can see on the right-hand side, uh, which we put into a survey and then send out to our employees. So we we're asking mainly questions about work or culture, work culture related uh, questions to keep it a bit simple, but also uh, related to the context. And if we go through that, it's mostly like name, job title, areas of expertise, like data, design, strategy, culture, like what is it that you do at work? What's your core talent that you believe uh, you bring to work every day? When do your best ideas hit you? Is it early in the morning or later in the night? Uh, how do you like to communicate? Emails, text messages, what's your style of communication? A uh, very Swedish question, what's your way to Fika? Fika is a coffee break uh, where you usually have some sort of baked good with it. So we're asking people how they handle that. And the last question was regarding space travel. So if that would become a common thing to do, where would they go? I'll get into the details uh, later. But next comes the tricky part, right? So now we have all that data collected, but how do you find the right metaphors for each of these questions so that it's legible for a person who has no idea what this is about and they can easily understand what's going on? and also finding the right level of abstraction that's still useful. So here are a couple of examples that we ended up with. One is visual metaphors that we used for a background pattern. So we turned their name, the user's name into a virtual pattern. So each letter had a circle represented on the card and it would change the size depending on how often that letter appears throughout the name. So every card had its own individual background pattern. Coming back to that question of when is your most creative time, we had that one uh, turning into an analog clock, like using this analogy of, of a clock showing the time when you're actually most creative. So just waking up would be pointing towards maybe 6 a.m. Commuting would be more towards like 8, 9 a.m. or enjoying an adult beverage as I do, it would be more like 4 or 5 p.m. in the evening. And here's another one which, um, comes back to this notion of space travel, where would you go? We decided that we're using these red crosses to indicate how far you would be going away from the center point of the card to show if you would be staying on Earth, if we actually go to the moon, or if you would go even further and go to the Mars. All of these now were pretty closed in the sense that the questions had like specific answers that you could choose from. There's just like a simplicity reason, but it could also be just very open questions um, with an open scale. And if you put all of that together, the outcome looked like this. So everyone in our company could create their own little data profile, uh, which would as assemble these elements that I just showed you into something like these postcards. 
And then you could have the chance to actually compare them to each other and see, okay, what kind of commonalities do we have? Like, do we communicate the same way? So we were noticing it's not only a good conversation starter to send this to the clients, but it's also interesting for us internally to get to know us uh, each other better. And then at the back side of the card is what you can see on the right side. We put a little legend so that the receiver of the card could actually understand and translate the symbols into something that makes sense for them as well. For those of you interested in the technicalities of it, uh, we gathered all the answers in a CSV file and then used a creative, a more visual coding language called processing. There's also P5.js out there, which I think could be a good solution. But in our case, we used processing to take in that data from the CSV and then turn it into the graphical elements that you can see on the right hand side, which resemble these um, postcards. All right, we've been talking a lot or have been talking a lot about uh, where data portraits came from. So, but let's also, I wanna take some minutes to speculate a bit on where this is going. And first of all, I think it is going in a pretty cool way that it would allow us to manage our cognitive load uh, a lot because there's so much data out there and data portraits make it easy for us to find pattern in larger and complex data sets. And that links directly to my next point, because if you can deduct patterns, if you can find things easily, it makes it also easier to find or connect with like-minded people. So if we're using data portraits as avatars, like in these postcards, it is super easy to find things in common with others and finding allies that you can connect to. If we're using them more as a data mirror, I think data portraits could turn into create uh, self-reflection tools and support us in revealing and shaping our own behavior patterns. And bringing in that metaphor again might make it easier for us to reduce certain habits or to increase uh, others and work on those. If we're taking a bit more of a business approach uh, on, the, on data portraits and what they could be good for, I think we've been discussing as designers a lot about personas and how useful they are and how or not useful they are. But I think data portraits could bring in a really interesting notion here and lay a foundation for data enabled user representations, which go beyond these casual pictures of uh, this mid aged man that you see um, representing your user group. But overall, there's also some danger that we bring in here because as an artist, you're creating something, you're inducing meaning to something. So it can be that you're choosing either metaphors that are ethically questionable, if that's really the way that you should represent that, as we had an example with these hate speech groups as flowers. Like, is that really what you should do? Yeah, there's artistic freedom, but still you need to think about like what other people's might perceive how other people might perceive it and what they might interpret from it and there's a risk then for the audience to jump to conclusions so if you see that somebody is contributing a lot you think oh my god this must be such a nice person but maybe they're actually contributing hate speech rather than um, than good content so that's that's a risk that, that i see with data portraits but overall, I would say data portraits are still a playground. So it is really up to us to go out there, explore, build things, tear them down and build them again and see what data portraits can be useful in the future. And maybe also find things where we believe that they're not useful at all. If this evoked your curiosity or if I left you confused, I believe we have some minutes now for a brief Q&A, but do not hesitate to also reach out on LinkedIn and keep the conversation going even after this event. I hope you enjoyed the talk. Thank you so much. And uh, yeah, there's also the Q and A at the Hangouts that I will be jumping over too soon. If you have questions, just drop them in the chat and I'll be here for another minute before jumping over. All right, looking at the time, I guess I'm gonna jump over to the 2D Hangout. Um, so if you have questions or if you wanna just have a chat about something, I'll be there. Um, feel free to jump over and casually hang out over there. Thank you so much for joining in. See you there. Bye-bye.